Before we get started, I would like to fill the audience a bit. How many of you here involved with a software development? Please raise your hand. Well, I'll say it's around 90%. What about hardware developments? Okay, let's say 80%, 20%, I would say. Now, how many of you feel that, uh, how, that software is faster than hardware during the development cycles? Okay. Is there anyone here that thinks that hardware is faster than the software in the development cycles? <laughs> well, I would like to talk to you after. <laughs> Interesting. But I think uh, in general, well, more or less uh, on the same page, and I wanted to validate uh, it. So, so the, fact that the challenges that you are facing with hardware, as I see it, is first of all, uh, in hardware, we often we, we develop uh, with multidisciplinary fields. So we have the uh, design studio, the engineering studio, manufacturing, supply chain, and so on. Every uh, interface like that has its own uh, culture, its own habit, and working together creates different communication gaps. So this is the first thing. Secondly, uh, in, in hardware, we have different demanding, operation, uh, demanding uh, operation of testing. So it, with physical products, uh, we, have, uh, we have different standards to, to meet, environmental conditions like rain, dust, and so on, where in code, in software, we don't have it. Also, uh, as I, more the comp most, most of the companies that I know of still work today with hardware, with the traditional uh, waterfall um, methodology, where in software I know that often most of the companies work in agile uh, workflows like Scrum and Kanban, and all of these, at the end of the day, uh, it creates higher cycles, I mean longer cycles, and more cost uh, for the other developments. Because in uh, other we have uh, dedicated uh, facilities, tooling, laboratories, and so on, where in software, most of these things we can do in-house in code. So I've been thinking about this a lot in Aviv Innovations, and I came up with a new uh, workflow which is more, I would say, more of a software uh, approach. It's an agile. It might be different from what we know, uh, what you may know in the software like Kanban or Scrum. But the idea is more or less the same, where we run the process in uh, iterations, in cycles, sprints, and not in a waterfall where we do one cycle with every stage that is very uh, in detail and maybe properly. So we start by a quick and dirty one cycles. We see where it goes, and from there uh, we iterate until we converge to the desired uh, result. And this method has been proven itself to reduce uh, cycles and costs. So we start with the, uh, the, the requirements through all the R&D stages, and when it is converged to the desired uh, requirements, we can move forward for the mass production. And also, I'd like to mention that most of the things we are trying to do holistically in-house because we found that uh, it reduces also a, a, a lot of times and, and costs. So the first study case uh, that I would like to talk about is about the Dolphin drone. It's an in-house uh, product that uh, is for uh, open source uh, platform and modular. And for multi-purposes uh, applications. And the idea that, how it came, uh, the idea, the problem, let's say, to, to, to develop the uh, Dolphin drum came from clients. So I met a lot of clients. They are a software company or an other company whose their product is either a software to control the drones or maybe an other, like a, a sensing pod or a spectral camera. And they need to interface with an existing product in order to validate and to operate uh, the system 
So they are what they're trying to do, they're trying to interface with an existing drones like DJI and others. Uh, sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. And the reason for that is, DJ, is because DJI is closed uh, closed system like Apple. So often what are these uh, companies trying to do is try to develop their own open architecture drone. And how they do this? They order the different components with open architecture, uh, the motors, propellers, chassis, and so on. And they try to, to, to create their own. Now in theory, it sounds great, right? But we all know that uh, in, in reality, integration takes a lot, it costs a lot, and it requires a specific know-how, in this case in drones, where in most cases, these companies, they don't have it, they have programmers or they have hardware developers for a specific uh, product. So, and this is the moment where I realized what if there was a platform that is reliable enough and flexible and with open architecture that they can use as a, as a base for their development. So we started as a, with a market research. We saw what, uh, what is going on in the market. And we saw that there are a lot of uh, drone companies with high-end solutions, reliable. But the problem is then that mostly they are closed uh, system. And what is existing in the open architecture is not integrated enough and it's not uh, reliable enough as the industrial grid. It's more of a DIY level. And the idea is to combine these two features of uh, flexibility and reliability into one product. So like any other projects or any other uh, other developments, we started with uh, setting up the, the requirements. So uh, for a specific uh, capacity, specific uh, uh, payloads with a specific type of light, uh, different components. In this case, it has to be uh, flexible enough for different changes. And it has also to operate in different uh, environment uh, conditions like rain and dust. It has to be robust enough and reliable enough to, to withstand the different uh, conditions and also uh, easy to operate and to maintain. So after choosing uh, the relevant component, and we started by laying out the chassis, by arranging the different components. Uh, there were a lot of uh, options, and for each option there were uh, pros and cons, and we narrowed down the options until we uh, got something that we wanted to move with. So after we set up uh, the, the, the base, let's say, for, for the components, we could uh, make the aerodynamic fuselage on top of this. Now the aerodynamic fuselage, it's uh, like an electronic enclosure that we know from other products, like our phones, computers, and so on, that it has to protect the internal components and to meet uh, different uh, environmental standards. But uh, on top of that, in aerodynamic enclosure or aerodynamic fuselage, as I call it, there is another function of aerodynamics. So the, the, the form means a lot because it can really affect the flight performances, uh, the drag, stability, maneuverability, and so on. Uh, in my case, I know that everyone has their own uh, approach to do so. I, I like to take inspiration, especially from nature. So the aerodynamic fuselage was inspired from a dolphin, and uh, uh, the main chassis was inspired from, the, uh, from uh, an orthopetra. And uh, after developing the, the, the forms and narrowing down the options, this, this uh, configuration was chosen, and with the more detailed sketch, uh, I could create uh, the different uh, options for uh, how to split uh, the, 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 the enclosure of different materials for manufacturability purposes. And after that, uh, we could start uh, the initial CAD model, so transforming from 2D to uh, 3D CAD model, and taking all of these constraints into consideration. And also, this is the opportunity to identify uh, problems from an, from an early age and solve them. Now I know that most companies in this uh, in this uh, stage would move forward for a more detailed CAD design and manufacturing, 
but uh, I would like to suggest another uh, solution, uh, another stage, which is inspired from uh, the, the automotive industry. So the thing is that when we are designing something in CAD and we ma manufacture it on the computer, it might look okay, it might, we might like it, but uh, when we manufacture it, it looks different. And the reason for that is because uh, computers' uh, screens are flat, and in order to solve it, uh, I'm suggesting to create a physical model. Uh, we can do it digitally, like uh, from 3D printing, CNC, or uh, other techniques, or manually with clay, as it's done uh, from the automotive industry, uh, or cheaper method like styrofoam, cardboard, and so on. And it's also an opportunity to adjust the design and update the 3D CAD model. Another very interesting uh, technique that I've been using recently and implemented to my workflow is working with VR. And for me, it's really a game, cha a game changer because it's sort of a bridge between the 2D world to the 3D world. Um, by designing with uh, VR, we can design 360 and perceive the object as if it is next to us. So it's really amazing. Uh, we can feel it as if it's really here. We want to touch it, but it's still virtual. Um, and it's really uh, narrows down the options and the needs to create a lot of prototypes because we can solve it in, uh, digitally in early, in early stage. And another technique that I would like to use is uh, rendering. Hyper-realistic rendering helps us to, uh, to check different material, different colors, and to see uh, how, how the final product would look like without the need to create every option like this. So after setting up uh, the initial design, we can move forward for a more uh, detailed CAD model. So this is an opportunity to design the, our product, the model for manufacturability and for different constraints, but also to identify problems and solve them in early stage, and also to prepare the model for simulations. So in terms of simulations, we have CFD to validate our dynamics, and we have also a stress analysis that we can validate the structural elements, that they can withstand uh, the different loads and moments. And another technique that I like to uh, use in my workflow is using um, the generative design. So the generative design is a strong tool. It's, a, it's an AI tool that we can insert the algorithm, different constraints like loads, volumetric constraints, materials, manufacturing technologies, and so on. And the algorithm knows how to take into, into consideration and by uh, defining different goals for, for uh, the generative design, like minimal mass or maximum strength that we can define, the, the model knows to, uh, to create outputs accordingly, which can be prioritized according to different parameters, like minimal mass, uh, maximum uh, strains, different materials, manufacturing technologies, and so on. And it's really interesting because the algorithm can come up with ideas that us as a human being cannot think of. Really complex shapes, like the arm that you can see on the right side, it's something that at least I could never think of uh, without this model. So after setting up uh, the, the, the design, we can move forward and create prototypes. So at first, a rapid prototyping, uh, also to check visually, but not only this, to check actually function. So we can check uh, geometry fittings, uh, loads with a test bench or uh, on test flights, manufacturability, and so on. And also another element that I would like to present it that uh, I split the, the structural design for, for models. In this case, you see the arms. The same way it was done for the main chassis, fasteners, and ad ad adapters, and other elements. And this let us the opportunity to simplify the problem and to focus on very specific 
elements on the design process, and also we can accelerate uh, the process and move uh, faster because we can uh, work in parallel on each module. The same idea and the same principle was uh, uh, was performed about the aerodynamic fuselage, which was first 3D printed. Uh, again, not only for visual purposes, but also for function to check and to validate geometry fittings, manufacturability, uh, loads, aerodynamics, and flight performances. And to be honest, the aerodynamic fuselage is something that really closes to my art because it's something that I've been researching since childhood. Uh, when I was competing uh, in drone helicopters competitions, and this is one of the main reasons why I went to study uh, aerospace later on, and naturally I'm still researching uh, this, uh, this uh, field. So here we can see uh, how we can validate the aerodynamic fuselage in different scenarios for, on the right side, in the right photo we can see uh, how we can check the maintenance and their geometry fittings. In the middle photo, we can see uh, how we can validate with flight different flight performances like stability, maneuverability, and so on. And in the left uh, side, we can see an aerodynamic validation with a wolf tough test, which is a cost-effective method to validate aerodynamics. So after it's, it, uh, the, the design was converged and with test to the desired uh, requirements, we could move on for a more mature uh, manufacturing methodology. And in this case, uh, the, the drone and the skin, the, the fuselage, was uh, fabricated from a carbon fiber and uh, fiberglass. In general, composites uh, materials are very common in the aerospace industry. So like any other phase, we start with ideation, different sketches to, ch to check different options which then transferred to a CAD model, and then it was fabricated with a 3D printed model. Now, usually in the, the traditional mythology to uh, create a, a mold for composites is by CNC milling uh, with materials like MDF, Sika block, aluminum alloys, and so on. And this is something that is not very conventional, how to perform, how to uh, manufacture uh, composites parts, and only this, decision saved and reduced cost by more than order of magnitude. Uh, the only disadvantage for this is that we could uh, create several prototypes for validation, but for uh, mass volume, we, we need to uh, perform it in the traditional way. But uh, the advantage here is that we can come to manufacturer in a more mature way, and it uh, really saves the, the manufacturing and the timeline of costs of uh, manufacturing. And also we, can, uh, we could get uh, the final product that it's very closed as if we could uh, um, manufacture it in normally in the traditional uh, uh, manufacturing uh, techniques like in uh, um, aluminum uh, mold and so on. So after it was fabricated, it was integrated and we put it to the test. And when it is converged, we could uh, move forward for the mass production. And at the end of the day, we uh, got a product that uh, it meets the requirements that uh, was predefined. So it's modular, meaning that we can adapt and uh, do different changes. It's open architecture, which uh, we can program it to our own needs. Uh, it's a dynamic fuselage is not only saves more than 10% uh, in energy consumption, but it also improves flight performances like stability and maneuverability. And it also protects uh, the, the internal components from different uh, weather conditions like dust and rain. And it uh, also it has its unique uh, presence in the market, which is very something that is very important today. As for its modularity, the idea here that uh, the, we preserve the core and we know to supply a conversion kit that can convert uh, one configuration to another and change it, uh, its spec so we can get different specs like uh, uh, flight performances, flight endurance, payload capacity and so on according 
to our client's needs for different purposes. So to sum up the study case for the dolphin drone, we have just witnessed the full process of analytic agile methods. Uh, we saw different tools, how to handle with changing requirements and, and to accelerate the, uh, the R&D process. We saw that uh, doing a rapid prototyping not only can produce for visual purposes, but also for function, uh, to test it in real life scenarios, but also to simulate the final manufacturing uh, methodologies and we can arrive and talk to the manufacturer uh, with a more readiness for the manufacturing. And another uh, study case that I would like to present briefly, it's about our client, Stedicopter. So Stedicopter is a company that develops a UAV helicopter and they approached us two years ago in order to uh, design for them a new aerodynamic uh, fuselage for their helicopter because they made uh, different changes in the chassis. And within a three months process implementing the agile and holistic workflow, we could get the final design, uh, which we managed to reduce more than 30% in uh, drag and reduce 20% uh, in mass. Just for the reference, this kind of process in, uh, in uh, the, the, the traditional uh, waterfall uh, workflow in the aerospace industry would take between one year to two years. So we really saved a lot here. And also this, uh, uh, due to this process, this uh, product is already in the market. And to sum up the lecture, if one would like to embrace the agile workflow to his company or organization, I would do to do. I, I would recommend to do the following. So first, try to be holistic, holistic as possible, meaning uh, that you have the different interfaces like engineering, mechanical department, electronics, software design. Try to develop one common language in order to reduce gaps. Secondly, try to use the modular approach that, as we can, as we saw, not only simplify the problem but also accelerates. Uh, the, the process, you try to use rapid, prototype, uh, rapid prototyping to leverage uh, your R&D process and to accelerate and also to simulate the final manufacturing. Don't try to reinvent the wheel because uh, there are a lot of technologies today that we can leverage to our needs. And try to be open-minded and willing to take risks. I know that um, embracing a new technique, new workflow, might be difficult at start, but at the end of the day, I think it worth it and it really saves a lot. And by failure, I believe that it's something that we learn from. And finally, try to hire people that uh, they are passionate about what they're doing, because I believe that if one uh, makes something that he loves, he push the boundaries and you get much better results. Thank you.